conceptualized this project Visegrad for Europe approximately a year ago. And this is our fourth event when we come together in a small circle in a workshop format. So actually I would like, if you don't mind, get closer because we, act, we would like you to participate. So we would like to offer a couple of food for thought and then would like all of you to participate, contribute, question, because this is a workshop. So we want to, we want to make it as interactive <coughs> as possible. So if you don't, if you wish, of course, you can stay where you are. But I just wanted to make it more convenient for you to, to join in. Um, the, the program, the Visegrad for Europe project, aims to create a pure European narrative for this region. This is a political project. Uh, but obviously, we work together with academics, uh, activists, everyone who shape a political arena, which we find very important here in Hungary specifically. It's not without reason that this project uh, was based in Hungary, but obviously we work together with our partners in the Visegrad countries and actually in the a wider Central Europe, we, because the problems and worries uh, on future of Europe are very similar. We have now two wonderful speakers and the very first panel, where and then I'd like to introduce you in um, Jane? Jenny. Jenny, okay, from the Central European University. She uh, is a professor at the uh, Department of International Affairs and um, she wrote a very nice paper to us. I don't know, hopefully some of you could went through uh, about the paper which was very, very knowledgeable and I believe you will present it to us about uh, the question of the profile and nature of populist, nationalist foreign policy. We are concerned, and previous workshops of this series, we stated that there is a special, special foreign policy uh, for the populist uh, and nationalist regime, uh, which we in Hungary and specifically Poland can uh, watch carefully and witness on everyday basis this very confrontational and proactive paper uh, or, or policy, uh, which I think it's very nicely um, conceptualized in, in your paper, which we are very curious uh, to present. And then we have Rosa Balfour uh, from the German Marshall <coughs> Fund. She's um, an analyst and researcher on, uh, on Europe. Is that your major field of understanding, <laughs> I think? Uh, Rosa has been a, a regular commentator and researcher of, of the development of the European project and today we will ask her to speak about uh, perspectives for the Visegrad countries and generally the Eastern Europe. Which for, is Europe. for Europe and pro implications for, Europe. for Visegrad. And I think that we can mm -hmm. by the end of this, uh, this panel come to us kind of, well maybe not a conclusion, but some kind of common understanding of how with this um, very uh, aggressive, mm -hmm. assertive, uh, populist approach, foreign <coughs> policy approach, how far this region can get. Uh, we are pretty concerned, and also at this one of the outcome of the previous workshops, that um, the position of this region uh, is very um, critical within the European Union in these days, and this is very much the cause of this highly opportunistic uh, approach, which was basically introduced by Viktor Orban, and now is very uh, prevalent in the region, and we can witness this kind of foreign policy attitude as far as we have to, and that's also a question how far we are, we regard Europe as a foreign policy. While populists do regard it as a foreign policy, we very often debate with them and we believe we are the European Union ourselves and then shaping the, the Union is, is a different type of task than, than confronting someone who is an outsider. So anyway, uh, this is just a couple of comments at first. Please come in. Hello, Chiara. Well, go, go and sit down. Hello, Chiara and Lena. <laughs> Good to see you. And. Um, Probably I give the floor to you. You discuss Me. that? Yeah. Okay, then I will <laughs> first. And um, please, please um, give our, your presentation. <coughs> Thank if, you very much. Is Thank this you. any, everyone hears us? So we don't need the microphone. It's actually much more comfortable not to use the mic. Thank okay. you. So just wave if you can't hear. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. It's wonderful to be in Budapest and it's great to be in this group. Um, 
If you've seen the, um, the description of this session, it's um, pretty ambitious. Um, there are questions about the state of the Union, uh, questions about what went wrong in the European Union, and also questions about what can be done. Um, what, I, what I'm going to try and do is um, give you um, a few ideas as to what I think the big problems of um, the European Union um, what I think they are. Um, I'll give you a few ideas about where the debate is, because there is a debate, and just ask questions as to whether the debate matches in any way what the big und core underlying questions um, are. And I'll try to think through some of the implications for this part of, this part of Europe. Um, <clears throat> and then I'll just throw out a few ideas about what I think the core source is of uh, the problems are in terms of populism, illiberalism, and just see, because I think sometimes there's, it, there's lack of, there's haziness around the concepts around populism. Um, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, the blame game, and you mentioned that earlier, you know, uh, against Brussels, um, and sometimes we're not sure what it is we're talking about, what the actual problem is, and what the origin of that problem is. So I'm just trying to try to bring, I hope, a little bit of clarity on that and address it in the context of the future of the European Union. Um, so, and then what can be done? Maybe we can leave that perhaps for the debate. I would be, mm -hmm. I would be interested in hearing um, what um, others uh, believe. Um, right, my um, starting point is, and this is based on a fair amount of research that I've been carrying out um, uh, especially looking at the relationship between member states and the European Union. Um, some of it has been published in a GMF paper back in March. The rest hasn't been published. And what I'm going to tell you hasn't been published because I haven't written it yet. So I don't know whether I ever will, so I'll share it with you. <laughs> um, there are three core cleavages in the European Union, in, in the geographical space, which is uh, covered by the European Union. And one of these core cleavages is about the social economic contract that binds member states together. So, of course, any discussion on Eurozone governance fits within this, within this rubric. Um, but also, I think the underlying problem um, that the Euro didn't actually bring about the real economy convergence that was expected, um, and um, we're not necessarily seeing solutions uh, towards bringing about that uh, real economic convergence. So, Europe, the EU geographically is still governed by a core periphery problem. Um, and this undermines uh, the unity of the project because obviously there are different interests among different countries on how to manage redistribution, how to manage uh, transfer, what kind of e economic and social solidarity um, should uh, uh, come about. The second major cleavage area, and sorry, I'm also following, you know, what, what, where have been, you know, the crisis of the p past 10 years, what areas they have hit, and of course, Eurozone crisis is one of them. The second area is security, um, with the um, Russian annexation of Crimea, um, and the refugee inflow. Um, and I think this underscores the other major cleavage that exists in the European Union among the EU member states, and that is a cleavage in perceptions of security. Um, they are fragmented, uh, divergent. There's quite a strong east versus south uh, division, but there are others that overlap with, with, within that context. Um, some, obviously, we've seen shifts uh, Germany, for instance, has shifted significantly on Russia, and so has France so far. Uh, but still, there is no commonly shared perception of what the security risks are in Europe. And this is a major impediment towards any development of the EU as a global actor, but even in managing neighbor neighbourhood relations. And the third cleavage, um, I have come to the conclusion, is not about immigration, it's about the relationship between sovereignty and democracy. And that ties in. It's because of um, divergent interpretations of what the relationship is between sovereignty and, and, and democracy, um, and, and the EU, of course, in the European context, that certain member states have issues with immigration policy. Right? So it's not about immigration per se. Um, of course, I start, my assumption is that the refugee inflow could have been managed differently. 
um, it was possible to manage it differently. Um, uh, this, I would say, that is actually probably um, one of the hardest political issues facing the European Union. Um, uh, and we're seeing what's happening in the relationship between Brussels and uh, Warsaw, the relationship between Brussels and Budapest, um, and it's pushing the limits of the EU because it's actually um, becoming problematic in terms of what the European identity is and what the European, the, the principles that bind it together. Um, so these are the three major cleavages which I think exist. Um, and which, if we want to think about a union which has a sustainable future and a long-term future, it's these three cleavages that need to be addressed. Um, it's not about PESCO, it's not about uh, multi-speed Europe. Those are tools which may or may not help uh, addressing these major cleavages. So where are we in terms of the debate? Um, there have been quite a few speeches of late, but then with the German elections, silence. Um, the reason being, well, I mean, the, 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 the sort of, the, 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 the easy justification is we're waiting for the coalition talks except to, to, to take place and we'll see what's going to come out of Germany. Um, the, the real, um, I think, reason is that on issue number one, which I think many will agree, cleavage number one, the economic and social contracts, which I think many will agree has to be addressed, is like the priority, you know, I've, I've put things in a, in a hierarchical way is the priority, it's not going to be addressed with, the, with the, the likely coalition that is going to come out of, out of Berlin. Um, I think uh, the proposals that Macron has put out um, will not be endorsed in Germany, um, and of course Germany is not alone um, in, um, in having um, a certain uh, notion of um, Eurozone um, governance. Um, um, nonetheless, we still have a number of ideas that have been put out, um, Juncker's idea. Well, there was this was there was a precedent. Was the scenarios paper that the Commission uh, published in spring? I think it was in March this year, which highlighted a number of scenarios. But I, I do think, and the, the institutions are actually working on the basis of that document. But my my hunch is that Juncker actually said, right, we pu published that so that we could throw it in the bin. This is what I want to do, and it's much more of a federalist vision. Uh, Macron's vision um, uh, includes the possibility of a multi-speed Europe. Um, I would argue that in both cases, um, it's um, both cases um, risk dividing Europe, and I think in both cases there's, there are very important implications for Central Europe. Um, but um, uh, they will probably be to the exclusion of Central Europe things being as they are, um, but because we're waiting for the Polish elections to take place in 2019, the likelihood is that we're going to see another period of muddling through, which the EU seems to be um, very good at. Um, these, um, um, as a, these ideas, um, with respect to the three core cleavages that I mentioned at the beginning, are not particularly helpful. Um, I mean, some would be if we had the, cir the political circumstances between France and Germany in particular to address the socio-economic um, dimension, but those conditions do not appear to be there. Um, we'll see. Um, I think it depends a lot on whether Angela Merkel wants to leave a legacy, um, her own personal legacy with a footprint on Europe, or whether she decides not to. And I don't have an answer to that question, but maybe Judy... <laughs> Judy does, knowing Angela Merkel much better than I do. Um, PESCO is now heralded as the big project in terms of security. Um, the European leaders are patting each other on the back because they've made, because it's likely that they will agree on it by the end of the year. Um, of course, it is a step forward, um, and it is more has been done probably in the past year than in the 20 year, past 20 years on security and defence cooperation in terms of agreements. But I think we should not forget that this is merely symbolic of a willingness to cooperate rather than making a, a big difference in terms of security and defence. Um, so I think this, so, so we, it, it's, it really needs to be seen whether this is going to be instrumental to bringing the member states closer together in terms of the real security threat perceptions that exist on the continent. And I have doubts about this because it's, it's, an, it's an instrument rather than 
uh, sharing a vision. It's not necessarily leading towards sharing a vision. It can work on the internal front. It can help on the internal front in terms of converging defence sectors, uh, but less so, I would say, in dealing with what the global challenges are um, that, and that Europe um, um, is uh, facing. And on the sovereignty and democracy piece, I think we're really struggling there. And I mentioned the Polish elections. Um, and I think here the issue um, goes back not just to the EU institutions and the mechanisms that exist, which can be perfectible, um, but also goes back to politics. Um, and here, this is where I would like to make some more general comments on populism um, and um, uh, where it comes from, illiberalism and what the sources are. Because in a way, focusing on the debate on the future of Europe is assuming that that is the source of the problem. And I would, I would argue that, of course, it's part of the problem, but it's actually not the original sinner. Um, the original sinner lies elsewhere, and Europe is very much a symptom of the problems that European societies are going through at the moment. Um, now, it's very hard to generalise, and I'm quite reluctant to do it in this context, because I do think that in Central Europe there are additional dynamics that differ quite significantly from what's happening in Spain or what's happening in, in the UK. But I do, I do want to pick out two big themes, which I think ought to be looked at in every national context. Um, the first big theme, which is often overlooked when explaining why populism, and that is the crisis of democracy. Um, and the, what, what I would argue is that um, uh, partly because of political parties failing to play their role as intermediaries between power and citizens, uh, partly because we have institutions of representative democracy which perhaps are outdated compared to technological change, compared to mobility, compared to big social trends. Um, also because we have delegated decision-making power to the European Union and to other international organisations, so the relationship between the citizen and decision-making is one step removed. Um, and finally, because we haven't accompanied Europeanisation and globalisation with uh, greater um, empowerment at the local level, uh, local government has been um, hijacked of its resources to carry out policies which are essential for, wealth, for citizens' welfare. So for this package of reasons, um, citizens are turning towards new forces. Um, and, um, and I'm not going to go into what these forces stand for. They're all sorts of different types of parties, um, different types of rhetorics. Some are nativist, some are xenophobic, some are anti-globalist, some are anti-European, some are a combination of these. There's, this would open a whole other Pandora's box. But I do think fixing the EU needs to be interpreted within the broader framework of the crisis, of general crisis of democracy. The second point, which I think is becoming increasingly salient, and I'm seeing a debate developing this is not, strictly speaking, my field, so I'm a bit cautious, but there is a, de a debate developing which is essentially focusing on economic nationalism. Um, it is an anti-globalisation anti debate. And I think the problem with this debate is that, uh, I mean, the, you know, the argument goes globalisation has not served the interests of citizens um, and therefore it in fact has, um, uh, um, you know, pockets of citizens around Europe have been... Um, <coughs> Have, have, have seen the worst side of globalisation um, the, um, the solution is to turn to economic nationalism i.e. states as the units that can best govern or protect uh, the, the, the country from uh, globalisation I think the, and this is very attractive both for the left and for the right and for the right we're seeing the example Trump um, for the um, left, that's where we can see some, some of the debates that is developing amongst academics. Um, and I would argue also some political parties, how the Labour Party, for instance, in the UK has, has shifted on, on this problem, on this issue. And I think the, the, the weakness of this debate is that there is no middle ground critique of globalisation as 
which ought to be understood not merely as a force that happens out there, but actually as a force that has been pushed, which has been pushed ideologically as you know hyper globalization. So there, there hasn't that that kind of discussion hasn't been taking place. But the, we'll see how this debate evolves. But it has huge implications. For Europe, because Europe plays a crucial role in managing these flows, and how it wants to manage them, whether it, whether it wants to have a stronger social dimension or not, is key for <laughs> citizens' welfare. So it connects back to the first big cleavage that I was talking about, um, the social economic contract. So it's not just about eurozone governance; it's also about regulation. It's also about the role of multinational companies. It's about um, many issues on that front. And the EU has huge competences there. Actually, on some issues, I would argue that it's actually pretty active. I mean, the Commissioner for Competition <coughs> is probably the best known one of all. Right. I don't know whether I've run out of time. Probably. Actually, oh. I hope so because I've finished one. <laughs> yes, you <laughs> did. Yes, you did. But basically, <laughs> so this is kind of big picture. Um, um, just to go back, sorry, to this part of the world, the way in which the debate is developing, I don't think is particularly congenial to the fate of Central Europe. Um, the way in which Macron, Juncker, etc. have put things is very much take it or leave it. Um, I think that we have leaders in Central Europe that really want to influence um, the EU um, in a different direction, um, and they might succeed. I think we need to take that in, into account. The direction is much more intergovernmental, a much looser form of cooperation um, and no interference in democratic, um, in the state of democracy in individual countries. Now, to counter this, if I may say so, I've also been doing some research on public opinion, Europeans at large actually think that the EU is, is a very valuable from the point of view of democracy. Hmm? Like 70% of Europeans believe, I forget the exact figures, I've probably got them in my handbag somewhere, um, the, the, you know, there's large uh, <coughs> public support for the EU playing a role on, on uh, democratic issues. So in my view, just to finish off, the, actually the, the weak link is the politics. And this moves on to the what can be done, because you also have questions of trans-party alliances, etc. Those are the forces that are not working towards making sure that the European Union is, is uh, a union of, of democracies. Um, they are not doing their job, right? It's not so much the institutions. Um, so, um, so the politics is actually a bit of the weak link here. Thank you. Sorry, I, I, my conclusion was a bit... Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. I, I cannot agree more than politics is the weak link in the game and kind of in, in, in capacity to uh, to figure out uh, the problems and respond. And of course, uh, our populism response goes nowhere. It's just a cover story yeah. for hiding all the problems we face, and we know it very well in Hungary. And obviously, uh, um, the, the entire mm -hmm. region and this highly opportunistic profile of politics, which we see in this part of the world, this post-communist, Political elite is more than more. Than, it's very different from the regime change by now, and it really has no answer to anything. And there is no discourse and no debate. And of course, this is an, a little yeah. uh, effort to to change this. So thank you very much, and Irene. Thank we you. We are very curious for. Thank you very much, and thanks thanks to Ishvan for inviting me and for putting this conference together. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Maybe move this. Bit. Access to this. All right, so uh, my name is Erin Jenny, and I'm a professor of international relations at CEU. Some of you might be familiar with um, what's mm. happening at CEU. It's quite devastating to all of us, but I think, of course, as always, the real victim is the Hungarian civil society. So I'm um, not too worried about the future of CEU. I am a lot more concerned about what's happening in this country. Um, let me just pull up my slides here. Okay. So, um, okay. All right. So, um, this is a project that is ongoing. So, um, I'm actually kind of presenting pieces of something that I've I have a larger sort of um, research project built around it. Um, right. So, it's populism, nationalism, and foreign policy in post-communist Europe. Um, and uh, this hopefully will be a book. 
Um, I already have a several articles that have been kicking around at various conferences, so it's a great opportunity to get maybe some feedback on some of these ideas. Um, so it's driven by a few different research questions. First, do populist and nationalist state executives uh, adopt distinctive foreign policies? Second, if so, how does populist foreign policy differ from nationalist foreign policy? And then finally, to what extent do these distinctions explain variable foreign policy behavior in Central and Eastern Europe? So this was originally kind of motivated out of um, <clears throat> an observation that from, compared to the 90s and 2000s, where you had a lot of uniformity in foreign policy orientation of the, the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, now you see a lot more variability, right? You see a lot less predictability. And I, I had this idea that, okay, clearly populism is part of the story, but I think another part of the story that people are just now kind of starting to become more aware of is nationalism, right? Which never really went away in this part of the world. Um, but it's intersecting with a kind of a new resurgence of populism in ways that I think are distinct from other parts of the world. So let me talk about that a little bit in the context of the literature on populism. I don't want to take too much time with this because I know this is maybe kind of boring, boringly academic for <laughs> from some points of view, but hopefully you'll kind of find this interesting. So um, the classical literature on populism is really based on the experience of 20th century cases of populist governance in Latin America. Perón in Argentina, Vargas in Brazil, Cardenas in Mexico, and much of this literature conceptualized populism as a distinctive set of anti-liberal left-wing um, domestic policies, such as currency controls and import substitution, right? And this, this, especially with the new rise of right-wing populism in Latin America, started to give rise to this, this dualist sense of there's left-wing populists and then a right-wing populist. But nobody really had a very good sense, particularly in, this, in, in terms of foreign policy or state policy, about what exactly that meant to left versus right, right? And there was this focus on policies, right? Um, specific policies like import substitution, like economic nationalism, um, without maybe enough of an awareness of the different ways in which populist, populism can be manifest, right? And this is what we're all kind of struggling with, is how to how to fit all these strange cases into this common rubric. We have a sense that there's a there's a, there's a, a common kind of engine called populism behind it, but how does it all work and how to think about them together in some kind of taxonomy. So particularly when um, this we started to see populist rhetoric in political parties in Europe, there, there came to be more interest in the populist literature on right-wing populism and less of a focus in Latin America. Right, and this is a newer literature. It's a different group of people. Um, Casmuda, I'm sure most of you are familiar with his work. So he comes right out of the tradition of party politics and right-wing extremism. Right, so he's looking at this from the point of, from the perspective of sort of tribalism. Right, mm -hmm. in ways that are very different from the the kinds of ways that people talk about populism in Latin America, which is much more focused on you know, uh, democracy and political institutions, right? There wasn't the sense that this was so much uh, a kind of a, a return of tribalism or nationalism or whatever. And so here you have these two sets of scholars that are kind of duking it out, and we're kind of involved in this sort of team, team populism now where we have scholars who are working in Latin America and scholars like me coming from nationalism, ethnic parties, ethnic conflict, and we're trying to kind of figure out, okay, what do we all mean by this term populism, and how does nationalism work in this? Oh, I sort of like flipped out of this, I see. Okay. Right, so as a way of kind of bridging these divides, right, Casmuda comes in with this, with this thin definition of populism that sort of takes policy out of it and says, okay, really, okay, <laughs> this is not going to work. All right, I'm just going to do it like this it's okay. then. It's okay. Listening it's you. okay. It's Your words okay. are more important. Than my yeah. words are more important. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm addicted to PowerPoint like most of my colleagues. Um, right, so, so, wow, that doesn't work at all. Okay, so 
the newer definite the newer literature hopefully yeah this is i'm gonna try again because <laughs> this is kind of a disaster <laughs> yeah so the newer definition uh or the newer literature hopefully can accommodate both latin american and european cases populist governments and parties because that was another feature another um, distinctive feature between the way that people thought about populism in latin america and here is that here it was much more focused on parties right and there it was really focused on governments right and leadership mm -hmm. right so it's a very different kind of form in which the, the populist populism is um, manifesting itself um, and then how to think about left-wing and right-wing populism, because for you who are familiar with the Hungarian case, what on earth is that, right? It's not, if you think about it in terms of economics, it's left, it's right, it's all over the place, right? It's not, it's not easy to categorize in that, in that classic sense of left versus right, at least on an economic dimension, right? So a lot of scholars have kind of dumped that and said this is it's kind of meaningless. It's a, it doesn't really work. If you put it in the models, it doesn't really explain very much. Right, so he talks about it as a, 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 like a rhetorical kind of frame, right? A thin-centered ideology that holds that the people are preyed upon by this ill-defined set of elites whose influence may require extraordinary, even non-democratic methods to counter, right? So here it's not so important exactly um, what they're doing, what sort of policies they're advocating, but rather the way that they're kind of redefining the, the polity, the demos, Right uh, to kind of take the institutions out of the equation and attach the leaders directly to the people. Right to 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 propose a direct kind of almost cosmic connection between the these elites who somehow can eat, divine the interests, the wills, the desires, the preferences of the people and elevate them to the level of policy. So this is this this works for a lot of us, and we're mostly adopting this. You can kind of see it, right? You can hear it when people when they talk about elites and the evil elites, and then the people and the people are the repository for all the things that are good and hopeful and things that can represent the future of the country. Um, so that's kind of where we are with the, with this literature, um, and what I want to do um, with my project is focused on foreign policy because most of this literature has really been focused on the domestic level. There are some suggestions about what a, a populist foreign policy might look like, but it's mostly, again, at the level of policy. It's, it's Euroscepticism, it's economic nationalism, um, but there might be something stylistically or institutionally um, distinctive about a populist foreign policy, and this is what I'm trying to, to grasp. Um, uh, and secondly, I want to contribute to the nationalism literature because those guys, you know, <laughs> they've kind of been sort of left a bit out of the equation. You know, like there was, there was so much more interest in nationalism in this part of the world in the 90s and then a little bit in the 2000s. But then it was like, oh, that's all gone. We're done. We're moving towards Europe. We're, you know, this is kind of old school um, but clearly, clearly it's still irrelevant, right? And, and it appears to be coming back again in a unique way and in a way that's interacting with populist elements um, in these societies. So how do these things interact to produce a, a kind of a, a unique effect on a country's foreign policy orientation? Um, and then I also want to contribute to foreign policy analysis, which hasn't dealt with this question at all about what, whether or not there is a distinct um, foreign policy. Ah, again. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, a contribution to post-communist studies, um, right, because, again, identity movements in the region have traditionally been understand, understood through the lenses of nationalism, Euroscepticism. People don't, I mean, Euroscepticism and European integration, that literature used to be so, 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 so big, right? And a little bit, people are kind of moving away from that because it's seen as a little bit of a dead topic now that, you know, of course these countries or most of the countries with the exception, exception of a few West Balkan countries are now in the EU. And just this is a kind of an old lens that people just, ah, what can we do with this anymore? It doesn't, it's a little bit unidimensional. Um, but I think that your skepticism obviously is a, there was the first manifestation of populism in this part of the world, right? Um, 
Right, and again, uh, contribution to populist governance literature, partly to spanning regions and partly um, because we might want to see how governance would work differently in parliamentary democracies in Eastern Europe, which again isn't most of the Latin American countries are presidential systems, so we should, be, we should expect to see it work very differently there. Okay, so this is my big um, kind of distinction that I'm drawing uh, between nationalism, nationalist mobilization, and populist mobilization. I think this is a way, the way to think about populism and nationalism in this part of the world, that these are two distinct logics of mobilization and logics of governance that, um, that call for different appeals to the people, right? So for nationalist mobilization, the identity appeals are all organized around ethnicity. Um, the goals are to promote the interests of an ethnic or national group, who is a we, all of those with membership in the nation, and the constituencies are ethnically defined. By contrast, populist mobilization, the identity appeals are around a political identity. The goals are to promote the interests of a state or political constituencies. Who is the we is all those who are politically aligned with the leader. That doesn't necessarily mean ideologically, but simply politically, right? That's an important distinction because, as we know, ide ideologically, populists are not really that consistent, right? Um, and the constituencies are politically defined. And then when you have the two together, it's, it's much more of a, of a kind of a narrowing and an intensification and a thickening of the sense of who the people are. So it's a, a kind of a restrictive sort of, um, you know, sense of who the people are. It's much more direct. It's much less sort of a focus on institutional mediation. So it's, quite, it's much more tribalist. And, um, yeah, ethnopopulism it can be a quite a, a dangerous kind of um, phenomenon in this part of the world or, or, or anywhere. So... I think, and this is kind of draw on the, some of the themes that you mentioned, I think this is a really nice way of formulating the, the, the crises that you have in this part of the world. Um, I, think that this, I think that this is emerging through a kind of a twin set of um, crises in, in this part of the world, the, like a, a political crisis. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, which is sometimes thought of as internal sovereignty, the sense, the sense in which we are governing ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a kind of a national crisis in some of the countries, maybe not all of them, um, where there's a sense of, okay, the, the, the question of in-out is a bit um, up in the air, right? So you have, this is quite often um, associated with external sovereignty, the sense that, you know, we're free from alien domination, right? So Benjamin, Benjamin de Klein, um, he, he has this very nice formulation where he conceives of nationalism as um, uh, politicization of the in-out, who's in the community, who's mm -hmm. out of the community, versus populist dimension, was a politicization of up-down, right? Who's actually governing us? Are we able to govern ourselves, or are there elites, or are there aliens from outside who are really determining our political destiny, right? So during periods of national crisis, so threats to external sovereignty related to borders, citizenship, other markers of national membership, ethnic cleavages are more salient and political actors make greater use of appeals to ethnic ethnically defined constituents as a way of maintaining power. During periods of political crises, um, threats to internal sovereignty, such as mass failure or lo loss of legitimacy of political institutions or system of government, ideological cleavages are more salient, and politicians make appeals to politically defined cleavages. And when you have these twin together, it's both, right? Mm -hmm. And it's even a narrower sense of who we is and who the constituents are and who will be represented by the political institutions. So, um, right. And I want to say in this context, I don't know how I'm doing on time. Two more minutes. Ah. Okay. <laughs> that's okay. I don't want to get you, too much you, into it. You can the... come back when they are. Oh, okay, that's okay, fine. All right. <laughs> um, I think it's important to point out um, that even though a lot of these populist claims are uh, framed in economic terms, like economic nationalism and so on, and, and, and this clearly is a, a concern to people, it it. It doesn't economic um, economic crises doesn't really explain the emergence of populism. What really accounts for it is um, political crises. 
So particularly the um, the undermining, and this is this is not my. This is based on a lot, a lot of research, a lot of statistical analysis that shows that if you look at if you pop in economic variables, you cannot explain very much in terms of the emergence and and strength of populist parties and populist leaders. Because I mean, you just look over Latin America; they were hit a lot of them by the same kind of economic crises, but. Um, populism didn't emerge everywhere. Didn't emerge in Chile. Didn't emerge in, in Uruguay. There are a lot of places that just didn't see this, right? And um, but where what you did have, you could really see this in Venezuela. The mainstream parties just collapsed in terms of their political legitimacy and popular support. So this really is. I think the gateway to um, the emergence of populist leaders is this political crisis, yeah. right? So, so, so this getting back to your points, um, this this sense that um, you know the neoliberal or the economic economic sort of institutions, that the political institutions, that everything is not serving people's interests anymore. People don't want to vote for the same parties. They're sick of these parties. They're not offering them the promised benefits that they that they had already promised them. Um, yeah, this is when they turn to people who are like, no, the, forget these institutions. They're not helping you. These institutions are bankrupt. You cannot trust them. You cannot trust the media. You cannot trust um, science. You can't trust universities. You can't trust the elites. I am not elite. I'm, a, I'm one of you, right? I am your champion. I am your kind of like peasant king. I'm going to circumvent all of these corrupt institutions that you don't believe in anymore, and I'm going to uh, um, represent you directly. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a form of direct democracy. Yeah. And so I think I'm just going to stop there, even mm-hmm. though I had a whole lot more, yeah. just in the interest of time. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much. It was extraordinary, I think. Uh, and um, I'm very...